Hey, hey, in today's video, I'm going to talk about seven mistakes I made when buying this house. I love my house and I'm happy to own it, but I did make quite a few mistakes when buying it. So let me share them with you so that hopefully you can be smarter when buying your property. I grew up in a detached house built by my grandparents in a quiet district of a small city. Flats were looked down upon by my whole family. I could say that it was because flats at that time meant miserable housing estates with thousands of residents, but in reality, living in a house was status signaling. Nobody even considered the benefits of an alternative. My first property in London was a flat, one that today would easily make it onto the never too small YouTube channel. It measured slightly over 30 square meters and taught me that I'm not a tiny house person. When buying this house, my ex-partner, who came from a complete different background, having grown up in a council flat in a slightly bigger city next to mine, was desperate to have a garden. And so when the search began and suddenly a house, yes, with a garden, in our price range appeared on the market, we were keen to buy it. Once we did, the garden ended up being an eyesore for as long as we lived together. Turns out that having a garden doesn't necessarily get you into gardening. The houses versus flats battle is as pointless as any battle that assumes there is one fits all solution. What definitely helps is to think of a house as something that is on the periphery, not in the center of your life. Unless you do want to make your house an all-consuming renovation project or simply don't mind looking after buildings. Houses come with a much bigger amount of maintenance and equipment to rent or buy. They also much less environmentally friendly. If they don't cost more money, when you compare them to flats with high service charges and leases, they definitely cost you more time. You have more control over your surroundings, but you also have more to control. It's a double-edged sword. And so when you are tempted by a house, check in with yourself if it will fit your lifestyle for at least another decade. You might discover that a flat will suit you better. My second mistake was not going on Reddit and Mumsnet. In other words, I didn't ask or even read answers to the ever important question. What type of building is the house I want to buy? British housing stock is so varied. You can get a Victorian, an Edwardian, a Georgian, a 1930s, 1950s, 60s, an upward house, a new build, and they will all be completely different. And they will all come with a set of benefits and disasters attached to them. It really helps to read stories of people who lived in a type of house you want to buy. Let's take this one. It was built in the 80s and if I were to buy it now, a quick search for 80s house opinion would return some positive results like this one. Easy to clean and decorate. Essentials like roof intact and easy to knock walls through to change layout. Easier to heat. And some not so positive opinions like this one. Zero character, thin walls so you'll hear everything everywhere else. The last point is so true. I can hear my neighbors switch the lights on and off. Is that bad? So my advice here is this, do your research and be as specific as possible. This is much easier with new builds when you can look up reviews of the property developer you're planning to buy from. But even with not so new builds, you can ask neighbors who live in a similar property right next door. And that brings us to my next mistake. It took seven months to complete the purchase of this house and I viewed it once on a sunny summer afternoon. Do you know anything that doesn't feel great on a sunny July afternoon? My ex-partner didn't view it at all. Honestly, this deserves a minute of silence. Viewing a house for what? 15 minutes, maybe half an hour to decide on something I'd be paying for and living in for a few decades. I spent more time contemplating and testing that sofa. And it cost less than one month's mortgage. For comparison, a house is a mortgage times 300 months. So what would I do now? I'd arrange another viewing. If you say that the price is right and the market is insane and that will only slow you down or guarantee you won't get the property, then I say a property not worth living in is not a good purchase. Do the bare minimum. Visit the street at different times of the day. That quiet cul-de-sac your house is located on could become a real nightmare given the right conditions. You want to know that sooner than later. Another mistake I made when buying this house was not understanding how property boundaries and party walls work. And that is a big one. At one point, we were considering an extension with my then partner and we hired a surveyor, a structure engineer, an architect, and guess what? Nobody had enough sense to check what boundaries this house had. 
only years later, when I was repairing my garden wall, did I discover that actually my deeds and my plans were different to the ones with the land registry. You need to know your property boundaries to know which walls or fences you're responsible for, for the maintenance, for the repair, for everything like that. And also to know your limitations, especially when you'd like to extend your house or place a garden house near a boundary. Because in most cases, you will need your neighbor's permission. And speaking from experience, that can be expensive and very frustrating. Your best bet is to download title deeds from the land registry, if you're in the UK, of course. It will cost you less than a meal out and it will be money well spent. They will show you correct boundaries, unaffected by years of resales and redrawings. And if you have walls, where exactly these walls sit? Along or bang in the middle of a boundary. Actually, there's this great booklet called the Party Wall Act booklet, and it will help you to understand how party and boundary walls actually work. It can save you many, many headaches and banknotes down the line. The next mistake I made is connected to the previous one. My garden wall repair was a very costly business. I suspected it wouldn't be as cheap as the lender predicted and lowered their house estimate by but I didn't get a quote to check it myself. A single quote, not even multiple ones, would be enough to challenge the bank's estimate and negotiate the house price down. And I didn't do that. So learn from my mistake. And if you spot a major repair, get a quote to see how much it will cost you to fix it. Don't rely on banks or even surveyors. My hairdresser was telling me the other day how her surveyor failed to notice the house she was buying had a subsidence issue. A decade later, she's stuck with insurers, investigations and lopsided property she can't sell. She did see the problem, but she ignored it as the surveyor didn't point it out. Don't be like me or my hairdresser. I attended a house viewing without a checklist. When you view a property, you often rely on your gut feeling and that's absolutely fine, but it really does help to also have a checklist. Otherwise, you might fall for what I call a pig with lipstick on. It's much easier to decorate a place than to address its fundamental problems. And many sellers do exactly that. If I were buying this house today, here's what I'd put on my viewing checklist. Insulation, including loft and floors. Age and state of. Here comes. The boiler and heating system. Electrics, doors and windows. State of all floors. Do they make any noise? Water pressure in all taps, state of the staircase, extension potential for side, rear and loft, and finally access to the garden. I mean, all houses have renovation needs, but knowing what you're getting yourself into will prepare you for addressing those needs. Basically, it would help you plan for your renovation expenses or help you work out which property you actually cannot afford. Make a checklist for your viewing. I'm definitely making one for my next house search. I'm sensitive to noise. I've learned to tolerate certain kinds of noise, but unlike my boyfriend who wouldn't notice anything and can sleep through anything, I find it easy to wake up because foxes are having a screaming orgy outside at 2am. Unfortunately, another source of noise that I pretty much always notice is airplane noise. And this is something most people don't care about, but actually should care about, as excessive airplane noise is linked to hypertension, for example, and long term can really negatively affect your health. When I moved to this area, I had no clue that certain parts of Southeast London are plagued by aircraft noise. So if you're in a similar club to mine and do mine environmental noise, check for flight paths, railway tracks, and possibly even locations of schools. I didn't, I checked crime statistics, but flight paths seemed less important. So now when I sit in my garden, I can see the airlines branding on the planes flying right above my head, all while wearing my beloved noise cancelling headphones, of course. And that's it, guys. If you're about to buy a house or a flat, keep this video in mind. And if you know somebody else who's buying a property, please share this video with them. It's so easy to miss these things. Let them learn from my mistakes. I mentioned my garden wall quite a lot in this video. If you want to know the full story behind it, here's a video that you will enjoy. Thanks for watching.